Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. What I am showing you right now is the tax credits that I've received from more than 18 different arbitration awards. And it's more than this, but I stopped at that point because I created an, my own cap. Why? Because I don't need all of it. But what I can assure you is that over a hundred billion dollars has been donated to charitable organizations. People say, wait a minute, how are you going to do that? Because I donated all of my tax credits with the exception of two awards to this organization right here, TTOPP. All you got to do is go to TTOPP.org. I didn't start that just to be starting it. I started that because it was legitimate. That was the point. I wasn't creating a fraudulent or frivolous organization. Let me tell you the logic behind it because so many people are not understanding logic. It is beyond me. We have several things to talk about, so I hope you all are prepared. I hope you all are ready. The first thing you need to know is this is Water Fox. It's called Water Fox because the other one is called Firefox. Water and fire. <laughs> so this one is Water Fox. It is a Firefox based system. Now we're not going to go to federal withholdings because I could care less about federal withholdings. We already went to federal withholdings. Let's see if it's going to give me what I need. As a matter of fact, you know what? We're not going to let you guys wait on hold this time. Wait a minute. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take this and we're going to be systematic about it. What happens is there is a federal policy favoring arbitration. It is well established, well recognized. These are just some of the cases. Okay? Understand, arbitration is federal statute. But it's not just federal statutes, it's even statute at large. But it's not just statute at large, it's even common law. So arbitration is protected by so many different aspects of law. So arbitration, Bradley Christopher Stark, this was what that young man discovered. I say discovered because it's always been there, but he discovered the Federal Arbitration Act and the federal policy favoring arbitration is strong not just semi-strong the courts want they don't want this they don't want you to recognize that the federal arbitration act establishes a strong federal policy favoring arbitration now we put federal now watch this make sure it's not just on the federal level let's make sure it applies to the states as well so we put in national policy, and we're going to do the keyword search. I've been using the keyword search lately, but we're going to put the national policy favoring arbitration. And we're going to see what's what. Sorry, I have two dogs that are looking at me right now while we do this because they so much want to go outside and play in the mud. But my dogs are not yard dogs. They're house dogs. My dogs will always be house dogs. And so... They are being very nice sitting here while I'm talking. It was taking too long. So let me put you guys on hold again. Be one second. Uh-oh. Screen is frozen. Let's do it this way. And pause. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. There is a national policy favoring arbitration. This was one of the cases that's really solidified that but hall street and associates highlighted the national policy favoring arbitration there is nothing anybody can do about it because the president in 1925 signed the federal arbitration act in 1925 that congress enacted so that's two branches of government coming together the same as with the 1933 act Two branches of government coming together and agreeing on something? Supreme Court has no jurisdiction over it. But hold on. 
This is not about trying to get around the courts. Let me show you why. Give me one second. The voice recognition is still picking up my voice, so I'm going to have to shut it down. So one moment, everyone. Okay, what I put in is arbitrators are federal judicial officers. I couldn't just put in their judicial officers, but they're federal judicial officers. Why? Under the Federal Arbitration Act, an arbitrator sits as a judge between the parties. They're not a judicial officer over any other matter but the matter that is before them. They only remain a judge over the matter so long as they're making a decision on that issue. Once the award is issued, their duties are fulfilled. They don't have to do anything else, say anything else, talk about anything else. However, until such a time, as is the case very soon, the arbitrator can go back and revisit an award if it left itself an option. And it does when it says that a person must respond within a certain period of time. So give me one second, please. It is necessary that I explain this to you so you'll see how everything stands, where I've been coming from as an individual. So pay attention. And concludes that orders issued by an arbitration panel, even if it's one arbitrator, it's still a panel, should be accorded the same difference and have the same force of law as judicial orders. Indeed, a careful analysis of cases addressing the scope and effect of arbitration compels this conclusion. An arbitrator is a judicial officer invested with judicial functions and acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. Arbitrators are judges, people. Arbitrators are judges. So, arbitration is a federal matter under the Federal Arbitration Act. Arbitrators exercise judicial function. They are judicial officers. Okay, they are an e-nominee judge. So let's find out what this phrase means because this phrase looks like it could be confusing to some people because it's a mixture of pig Latin and English. Did you say pig? Yes, I did. So one second, y'all. Let's have it be explained for the rest of you. Be right back. Those of you who know me know I do not like to use Wikipedia, but here on Wikipedia, this is what it says about the nominee. It means in name, technically, it could be translated in name only, but it doesn't mean that in this instance. It says, and Eo nominee classification is usually a well-known name or a term or includes all the items in that class of articles, regardless of form, unless the language of a particular provision limits the scope so as to exclude certain items. So, ladies and gentlemen, they are judges. They are protected by sovereign immunity. See, when this is used by the courts, it is usually associated with sovereign immunity. That's why, let's go ahead and prove that. Right here, in the very next line, very next case, it'll let you know that these judges are shrouded with immunity because they exercise a judicial function. The next one, the exact same thing, because they are protected by immunity. Why? Because they are judges and they have judicial immunity. The arbitrator enjoys judicial immunity, not because they're dealing with a case that doesn't involve the government, but because they're dealing with anything. They're acting as a judge. An arbitrator is a judicial officer invested with judicial functions and acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. They can't sentence anybody to death. They can't sit up there and repossess anybody's car. But what they can do is issue an order, issue an award. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to go to a court. You don't need to go to a court to get your award confirmed. 
Watch this. Arbitrator awards are judgments. That's what I put in. We're going to go, not keyword search, we're going to go to parallel searches where we get the exact phrase we're looking for. So, give me one second. I'm also making quesadillas. Ladies and gentlemen, you will find some courts saying arbitration awards are not final judgments. However, that's because they're speaking generally. Final judgments amongst the public. However, in short, arbitration awards are regarded as final and binding upon the parties as a judgment of a court. Arbitration awards are judgments of a court, everyone. Arbitration awards is a final judgment. Please understand this. You don't need to get your awards confirmed because awards are subject to court-ordered, vacating, or modification arbitration awards are clearly, pay, pay attention, not final, valid, and final judgments unless and until they've been confirmed. That is a lie. Pay attention. Arbitration awards are final judgments. See, amongst the public, they are not final judgments, but amongst the parties, they are final judgments. So let's do this. Arbitration awards are final judgments. So let's take this right here and see what other cases we can find with the exact same phrase. To let you know how it's a play on words. But between the parties, the arbitrator is a judge. They cannot appeal an arbitrator's decision to anybody else unless the arbitrator has acted outside the authority of the award. Go back and look at sections 10 and 11. Okay, we'll be right back.
I apologize. You guys were on hold for that many seconds. I don't want to do this video over. I was at the stove. I thought I put it on pause. I apologize. As you see, the arbitration award, as noted above, is equivalent to a valid and final court judgment. Why? Because the arbitrator tribunal sits as a court. A confirmed arbitration award is a valid and final judgment. Now, who confirms the award? An individual can go to the court. In the Virgin Islands, or in Virginia, excuse me, a judgment, confirmation of an arbitration award is the final judgment. There's one that says Virgin Islands above. I'm not going to go through it again. You should have seen it. You would have seen it. As such, an arbitration award is a final judgment on the merits for the purpose of rest justica. Can't go shopping in another form. Therefore, the arbitrator's decision was a final judgment. Arbitration awards are judgments of a court, ladies and gentlemen. They are judges. Their tribunal is a court. They are final judgments. Be right back to explain to you guys, and I'm do sorry. I am so sorry about putting you guys on pause and not putting you on pause. One second. I apologize for multitasking. Therefore, an arbitrator's decision was a final judgment. Now, one more. The arbitrator award is considered a final judgment on the merits for the purpose of res justica. Not just for the purpose of res justica, but it's a final judgment on the merits. Okay? Let's do the other one so that you can see that there is another court who don't say for no purposes of no res justica. It says the purposes of nothing. It's an arbitration award is a final judgment on the merits. Certainly. An arbitration award is a final judgment on the merits. Now, here it says, thus the arbitrator's finding against this company on its RP Act and fraud claim is entitled to res justica if the defendants show that their identity, or excuse me, that there is identity of the parties and their privies and identities of causes of action. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing we're concerned about here is that when you get an arbitration award and the arbitration award is issued by an arbitrator, you don't have to get it confirmed. To prove to you, let's go and we're going to look for 9 USC 9. The reason why we're looking for 9 USC 9 is because we're going to show you proof that you don't have to get your award confirmed. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you do not understand me. I try to bring information to you that nobody else ever will. You will find that nobody else will ever tell you about what I'm about to show you. It is for what I'm about to tell you that they will change the Federal Arbitration Act. You will have to get your arbitrations done ASAP. If you haven't started, it is a short process. Remember, you have to have a prior relationship with the party, and the party will have to have violated some term or condition of your conditional acceptance. So, the contracts are already online. If you don't know where, you better ask someone else, because I'm not going to tell you that it's at SAALimited.com and on SATCOM911.com. Not going to tell you that. Okay? If the parties in their agreement have agreed that a judgment of a court shall be entered upon the award made pursuant to the arbitration and shall specify the court then at any time within a year got to get rid of this sorry I was waiting for that to pop up any time within a year after the award is made any party to the arbitration may apply to the court so specified for an order confirming the award and thereupon the court must grant such an order unless it is vacated why because the arbitrator already entered an order it says the party agreed at a judgment of the court you don't have to agree to let a court issue the order that's your choice it is not mandatory that you get your award confirmed by a court you have to agree that a judgment of the court shall be entered upon the award made pursuant. Other than that, between the parties, the arbitration award is final. How do we know this? Watch. I will show it to you. We're just going to go and we're going to put number one there and we're going to hit enter. And then we're going to have a conversation. Is that all right, everyone? 
Maritime transactions and commerce defined. Arbitration award has to include commerce. So, maritime transaction is defined as any of these things, don't worry about it, yours fits as a commerce agreement. Now that you know that your contract has to include this, let's find out if your award is valid. Pay attention. Let's find out if your award is valid. We're gonna go number two. The contract is valid if it includes this and all the other elements of a contract. Now we're gonna find out if the award is valid. Validity, hold on. A written provision in a maritime contract, number one, okay? Or a agreement in writing to submit to arbitration an existing controversy arising out of such contract, transaction, or reversal shall be valid, irrevocable, enforceable, saved upon the grounds that exist in equity for the revocation of contracts. Now, let's find out if the contract can be revocated. Revocated. One, zero, enter. In any of the following cases, the United States court in and for the district wherein the award was made may or issue an order or make an order vacating an award upon application of any party to the arbitration where the award was blah, blah, blah. The award has to be procured by fraud, corruption, or undue means. They have to violate law. Wait, hold on. Okay, so the award can be vacated. Hold on. I want y'all to pay attention. We're going to skip and go to number 12. Skip to the loop, my darling. And hold on, I just need you all to pay attention because sometimes people don't pay attention. And so now we're gonna break it down for you. This will show you why each one of the awards that I have that total this amount are valid. Let me explain to you why they are valid. Notice of motion to vacate, modify, service, stay of proceedings. Notice of a motion to vacate, modify, or correct an award must be served upon the adverse party and his attorney within three months after the award is delivered. Don't worry about nothing else. If they did not vacate the award prior to the three months, the award is valid, enforceable. You must understand that. Does it matter if it was later determined it was procured by undue means? The Federal Arbitration Act does not have a cause or a provision for hearing a motion to vacate beyond the three month statute of limitation. This is a statute limitation within three months, 90 days. It equates to 100 because you count the amount of time it shall be delivered to the party. So give it 10 days. We know it doesn't take 10 days, but this is COVID season. So 100 days after the award is issued and the arbitrator gives you proof of service that they've delivered it, you are scot free. All you have to do is say, hey, I forgive you of this debt. Go after your tax credits. Why? Because the tax credits are given to you automatic by the government. We're about to have a discussion. Give me one more second, please. I'm gonna hope to keep this down to three minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, if the adverse party is a resident of the district wherein the award was made, so they can only do a motion to vacate in the district wherein the award was made. Let's make sure that. This is number 12 saying that. Let's see what number 10 says about where the motion to vacate has to be. 12 says it has to be wherein the award was made. This is section number 10. It says, was made. So in and for the district, wherein the award was made, the courts have been trying to play games with people saying that it doesn't mean that it has to be petitioned for vacating in the district where the award was made. If they don't petition for vacating the award in the district wherein the award was made, it's an invalid vacating of an award. The award remains valid. Now, breaking it all down for you, I'm gonna give you a scenario. 
Johnny has been dealing with Mary Lou McGillicuddy and Desi Lou Arnaz for more than 10 years. They have a contract. Johnny May has been handling all of Johnny May's business. Johnny May has been complying with the terms of the contract, but Mary Lou and Desi Arnaz are making things more difficult on Johnny May. And they send Johnny May a notice of change in terms and conditions, like Google has been sending everybody, letting them know that they're about to change their terms and conditions on January 5th. Ladies and gentlemen, I've sent Google my notice of change in terms and conditions and Google did respond but they did not provide all of the information being requested they're gonna receive a notice of default very soon do you follow me so now Johnny May sends she goes online she goes to SAA limited.com she goes to the section called the contracts and she pulls up the corporate contract or the contract that fits her situation and she fills it out and she sends it to Mary Lou and Desi Arnaz company and they get it and they got a problem because if they respond they've accepted the contract if they don't respond they've accepted the contract so it's a catch-22 for them because it's the same situation they put you in when you respond or you don't respond they put you in the exact same situation if you don't respond to them, then you accept their offer. If you do respond to them, then you have pro committed performance amounting to assent. You have did conduct or an act or an action that amounts to assent. Conduct amounting to acquiescence. So you're putting them in the exact same position they've been putting you in. After 10 days, because the contract only gives them 10 days to respond, if they fail to respond within 10 days, you simply say, well, thank you. I appreciate you for setting the offer, but look, you still haven't complied. You haven't supplied the information that I was requesting. You are in fault. I'm going to give you three days to cure it, to prove that you did respond and that, or you did not receive my counteroffer. Then you'll send them with that notice of fault proof of your sending them the counter offer and proof that they received it which means they can't rebut it so three days later case sera, sera now you apply to the arbitrator saying hey uh, we had an agreement I sent them this agreement and they did not comply and now they're in default and I just need an order from you showing that they're in default ladies and gentlemen courts issue default judgments clerks issue default orders on people all the time that's why it's called a clerk's default and it, guess what if you don't appeal that clerk's default then it's a judgment ladies and gentlemen with an arbitrator an arbitrator is already a judge a clerk is not a judge we just showed you where an arbitrator has judicial authority between the parties that's why you don't have to get an award confirmed because it's a judgment between the parties. So now you go to the arbitrator. The only thing the arbitrator is there to do is to determine whether or not there's a default. That's all the arbitrator is there to do. They're not there to hear anything else. It's just like going to court and having um, an issue before the court of unlawful detainer. The court's not there to hear anything else other than whether or not you're in default, whether or not you have a right to be in that property. That's it. That's all the court's there to hear. Same thing with the arbitrator. They're only there to hear whether or not a party's in default. And if they're in default, the arbitrator has no other choice but to issue an award. Now, the arbitrator sends them notice, hey, I find you guilty of being in default, and I issued a final award. You have 30 days to pay. Now, they don't want to pay. They're not going to pay. So six months, 10 days later, you say, hey, I forgive you. Yeah, you had 90 days to, to sit up there and try to get a vacating of this award, but you didn't do it. And because you didn't do it, man. Even if they tried to go to the court to get the award vacated, they would have to go in and for the district where the award was issued. They will not. Why? Because they don't have the means 
a paying for that attorney in that district and bringing the arbitrator who issued the award, because the arbitrator doesn't live in the district where the parties live, the arbitrator lives in their own district. So that creates a conundrum for them. And the arbitrator will only be testifying as to the facts. They will not be testifying as to an opinion. And they must bring a motion to vacate the award within 90 days. Each one of the awards that I have, no one has ever contested. Not a single party has ever contested a single award. Yay! Which is why all of the awards are valid. Many of them well beyond a year. That's what we're getting ready to do with Bradley Christopher Stark and his award. Because his award has never been contested. No one has ever contested the award. And guess what? We already sent out the bill. They have not paid. We're going to deem it as an uncollectible debt. A wholly um, uncollectible debt. Because the whole debt is not collectible, we think the other party will not pay because we have been trying to get them to pay. We're just going to write it off on the taxes. We have all the proof of all of the services of the document. Now we're going to write it off on taxes. Can you see when the IRS gets this? And then when the IRS doesn't want to pay the total amount because they're not going to want to give the total amount in tax credits, you better believe they're not going to want to give the total amount in tax credits. Because once you give me that amount in tax credits, I can start writing bonds and using the tax credits to back my bonds. Y'all need to pay attention. So, ladies and gentlemen, the contracts are up there. You all are going to have to get this done. I told you three years ago, the only reason why they haven't changed the Federal Arbitration Act, not because we're taking advantage of it. They've been taking advantage of it all these years. But now that we know about it, now that we know the loopholes in this stupid act, ladies and gentlemen, this was not designed to help you. This was designed to help the corporations. That's why you look at all the major cases. It's with corporations. It's not with individuals. This is a corporate government. Now that we're using the same, and now that I just told you guys that you don't have to get your award confirmed, that there is no law requiring you to get it confirmed, that it is a judgment between the parties as the arbitrator is a judge. So it is a final judgment between the parties. They are bound by that final judgment. You can look up the case law for it. Guess what, people? You don't have to get it confirmed by a court. There is no law requiring it. It says you may if there is a provision in the contract for a judgment of a court. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, if they don't want to pay then you follow the debt collection procedure. You have every right. You can put a lien on things if you follow procedure. So now I go to the arbitrator. I say, hey, here's, I'm just letting you know, this is all the paperwork. I done filed this with them. I done sent this to them. And the contract clearly says it has an arbitration agreement. It has a commerce clause because it involves money. It's between two or more parties that are a competent age. It's a doable and workable contract because it, it puts requirements on them and myself that are equal, not ambiguous. It's clear and easy to understand. It has an expiration date. It even had an opt-out clause. Not only did it have all of these things, but I took the time and I served it upon them and I have proof of service. And they agreed because it has a clause in it that says, if they do not respond while having a duty to respond, then it will account as performance and their acceptance of the agreement. And I just need you to see if I've documented everything right and if I'm correct. And if it is, I just need you to declare that they're in default and issue a judgment in my favor. That's what you're doing with the arbitration. That's why you're filling out the disposition remember SAA and it won't be SA anymore SAA is going to be forwarding it to the Eon Foundation and the Eon Foundation will definitely let all of you know from this point on that if your contract shows all the elements of a contract has an arbitration clause and all of the elements that I just mentioned 
and the other party had a duty to respond, and you can document that there was a prior relationship, then the arbitrator will only do a disposition whether or not there is a default. The arbitrator will not be concerned with anything else, and the arbitrator will issue an award that is reasonable between the parties. Just that simple. Because that's how it was always supposed to be. The arbitrator will send them a notification that they are required to pay. It is called a debt collection letter. It's a part of the award. When the arbitrator sends that to the opposing party, they have 10 days to pay that. Sec I'm sorry, 30 days, apologize. 30 days to pay that. If they fail to pay, all of those 30 days count towards the six months. All you have to do is wait six months. Once six months have elapsed, you can file quarterly, biannually, or annually on your taxes for that credit. The arbitrator will document proof that they sent it out by doing a proof of service. This is the process, people. It will not change, has not changed, and do not let the courts uh, permit you to think that there is a whole lot more to this than there actually is, because there is not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I would be doing if I had a debt and I needed to offset that debt or if I needed to create tax credits and I had a corporation I was dealing with that wasn't being fair to me and that was constantly, like Google, sending me notice of change in terms and conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, if they can send me a notice of change in terms and conditions, I can conditionally, because it's a change in terms and conditions, I can condition, condition, conditionally accept their offer because it's just an offer. That's why they're sending a notice. It's just an offer. So I can accept their offer and I can return an offer. If they don't want my return offer, then that means that their change in terms does not apply. We go back to the original agreement. But my agreement says something quite different. Here are my conditional acceptance. You need to provide me this information. Even if you feel that you don't have to provide it, you must provide it. Other than that, you agree to the agreement. And then I stock up my tax credits so that I can create my bonds, and then I go from there. All right, my dog is letting me know she has to go outside because I'm going to have to hurt her. I know she smells my food. You ain't getting none of my food. All right, everybody, y'all take care. I hope this information finds y'all in good health, and I hope you find it beneficial. Goodbye, everyone.